It is great to be with you at the Southgate Media Group Marathon. I'm just going to say that, and that this episode of Advanced TV Herstory is being recorded for release later, which is a wonderful thing. And I'm saying that mostly for my loyal listeners who are total rock stars. And podcasting, as you know, can be kind of a lonely, lonely experience. We put out a recording about something that we love, and for me, that's talking about the fantastic stories of leadership and persistence and achievement by the women in and of TV. And it's all for humanity to critique and appreciate and enjoy. Um, But, you know, we're podcasters, so we really never get to see the audience. So to be able to be together here in person at the Blue Box in Elgin, Illinois, to share my show and meet with others, with all of you in person, is a pretty excellent thing. And so, foremost, my thanks to Rob Southgate, wherever he is, um, and his dedicated team, you guys, and Martha. You guys are so incredible that you've created this marathon and that you're allowing me to participate. I mean, it's important to say thank you, right? Um, And when you read the news and you know that podcasting is taking off like gangbusters, you also maybe know that the number of women who are creating podcasts is increasing as well. And that's a good thing, right? So ladies, whether you are here today in person or listening to Advanced TV Herstory on your own schedule, you're thinking, hey, I could do that. Well, please contact me because I was that person once upon a time. I said, I can do that. And I'll share contact info with you at the end of this episode as to how to get a hold of me. But I'm happy to chat about setup and costs and the many, many benefits and rewards. So podcasting is here to stay, and I'm incredibly confident that the future Southgate marathons, which Rob is already committed to hosting, will be held in larger venues with larger audiences, and we will continue to gather some of the Midwest's greatest emerging talent. So without further ado, let's talk TV. That's why we're here, right? Advanced TV Herstory takes a well-researched, thoughtful, sometimes provocative look at the stories of TV women. And ask anyone, anyone in this room, what's your TV show? What's your favorite TV show of all time? Martha. (laughs) X-Files. Okay, well, you keep thinking, and when you are ready to share, here's the deal, is that when, normally when I ask that question, and you know, you'll come up with like 15 answers real quickly, and it's because really what we've come to understand is TV has such an important role in our lives, and as women, we um, immediately begin to remember all of the strong women characters and women TV shows. And so those story arcs and the characters, they've left this profound impact on women and men. And every once in a while, I stumble into a moment uh, that happened on TV um, or a show that should have looked like it would be a big hit, right? On paper, it reads like it should, and it should have been great. But in real life, it falls flat, and those stories have to be told, too. That's how we learn things. Um, But something might fall flat flat or not pack the punch that was originally thought. So I'm going to tell you this story about something that happened on February 26, 1996, And that was the Monday evening late into the season of CBS's original fall lineup, 1996, 21 years ago, when Elizabeth Taylor either appeared on or was referenced throughout four women-based sitcoms. And you're thinking, well, where was I? So your advanced TV history lesson is this. Um, You're going to get a better understanding via this funky time capsule of TV of how women's roles have actually evolved over time. And you're going to really come to realize that there's this total lack of memory of the fact that this even took place. This thing called Taylor Made Monday, which CBS put some money and some effort into. And then you are going to perhaps reach the same conclusion that I did a long time ago. And that is that Elizabeth Taylor was a much smarter woman, businesswoman, not just a tremendous actress, than most people give her credit for being. She really had it figured out there toward the end. So 1996, let's think about this. I just keep asking myself, where was I? And why didn't I remember this? CBS's Monday, light, my, blah, 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 whoa, whoa. CBS's Monday night lineup might have needed some boost. Um, it might have needed some caffeine or some love because there were a few shows on there. There were four shows in all. Two of them were dogs and two of them were classics. So we're going to talk about the influence of that lineup. 
Um, but ultimately, those dogs, when you start hearing what the chemistry looked like, you'll say, I totally agree. If you were in Chicago in 1996, then at 7 o'clock on Monday nights in 1996, CBS, you watched The Nanny, first off, 7 o'clock. Fran Drescher, it was, she was in her third season, they were getting solid ratings, and she was leading a team of talented writers and directors who, in many cases, were taking old comedy sitcoms, or old comedy situations, old hacks, and they were from Vaudeville and Preston Sturges and I Love Lucy. And they tossed in this funky Brooklyn accent. And it was really quite clever. And it was very well done. So Miss Fine, as we remember the nanny to be, she was the nanny to Mr. Sheffield's children. And then there were also these regular appearances by her mother, her helmet-haired, well-endowed Cynthia Fine, who was played by this over-the-top actress named Renee Taylor. Okay, And they were a great pair. They really had some chemistry. So in this episode, in 1996, Mr. Sheffield has invited Taylor to his family home for a business meeting. And... Um, as you, if you're familiar with The Nanny, you know that there's some tremendous physical comedy that's involved, and so it's tough to set a non-visual stage for, Freshers, for Fran Drescher's brilliant physical comedy on this, her facial expressions, and the chemistry that the cast and the writers had worked up to this point. Um, but what you do need to know in this, and we're about to do a clip, is that Fran Drescher's mother, played by Renee Taylor, is hiding in the closet, and she too is dying to meet... Elizabeth Taylor, this is such an honor. I'm Fran. So, are you Maxwell's wife? Oh, no. I just work for him. Actually, I've never been married. N not even once? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, there was one time, but then I thought about it. <laughs> that was your mistake, dear. <laughs> Shouldn't you tell Maxwell I'm here? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure, sure. You know what? I'll just buzz him. Just buzz him. Buzz, buzz. <laughs> well, I'll just go hang up your coats. What are you doing here? The boy let me in. I gotta meet Elizabeth Taylor. Excuse me. <laughs> My dad. So how many times have we heard that basic sort of bit? Um, it's well-timed and it never gets old. This episode, which was entitled Where's the Pearls, was, was directed by Dorothy Lyman, who Lyman in and of herself is this incredibly connected uh, woman in Hollywood Warhorse. She created the role of Opal on All My Children and Naomi on Mama's Family. And she herself is a shirt tail relation to Candace Bergen. Uh, their husbands were brothers. So Elizabeth Taylor was one day short of 64 years of age when this episode aired, and she was in fact a bit past the prime of her iconic look. She was a decade removed from that very public role that you might remember her for um, when she embraced, she was really embraced as the leading fundraiser and advocate for AIDS research. And at that time in her work, she raised more than $250 million dollars for AIDS, that was in the 80s, and she openly criticized the Reagan administration for dragging its heels and funding the research for a disease which was killing her very dear friend, Rock Hudson. And it would go on to claim the lives of so many other talented uh, entertainers, and Taylor is really remembered for this part of um, tremendous humanitarian effort. But at this stage in her career, 1996, she was just simply having fun and making a ton of dough off of her perfumes, white diamonds, and now black pearls. So black pearls is the theme of these four sitcoms, or a very subtle thread, and it gets subtler as the evening went on. So unless you have the DVD, there's no way for you to see that full clip that I just gave you, that little piece of. On YouTube, you will find, however, the eight minutes that comprises all of Taylor's appearance. And it was a great cast, very talented cast that hung together for the whole course of the show. And uh, you might remember the butler, Niles, and he, too, was a, as starstruck about her, Elizabeth Taylor, as Fran was. Oh, how do you do, Tiss Mailer? I'm Biles the Nutler. <laughs> That's not right, is it? 
this way, Elizabeth. Just follow the nutler. Oh, you're right there, Maxwell. Oh, Fran, could you do me a massive favor? Yes, yes. I'm wearing these for a photo shoot to promote my new fragrance, Black Pearls. <laughs> Say, could I? No. Oh. <laughs> could you just call a bonded courier and have these sent to this address? You're in love. Oh, oh, yes, my queen. Yes, that call will get made. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> oh, so, Elizabeth Taylor, this is such an honor. Yep. All right. So, as you can imagine, the... Yeah, what unfolds? Fran's mother, Cynthia, convinces Fran that a bonded courier is not necessary. In fact, it's more likely that that bonded courier is going to get robbed. So Fran decides to deliver them herself. But the taxi she's in gets into an accident. She suffers a con concussion and loses the memory of ever having the pearls. And she loses the pearls. They are left in the cab. So that plot thread is picked up at 7.30 that evening with a show that you have never heard of, and it was called Can't Hurry Love. And it enjoyed its final episode of its only season that night as well. Um, but this gem starred Nancy McKeon, otherwise known as Joe from The Facts of Life, uh, which had ended nearly 10 years earlier. So they were obviously trying to kind of restart her career. And a relatively unknown Mariska Hargitay, which was done three, this is three years before Law & Order SVU. So, and that show is now in its 19th season. So all of a sudden it's like a, well, what if? But it's very hard to see Mer uh, Hargitay in any role other than the iconic lieutenant and SVU's commanding officer. You know, she has, she has really created that role that has tested time and will go down in massive TV history. But it's even harder to see that um, her great attempt at comedy with bad writing was just kind of a disaster. So those characters, played by McKeon and Hargitay, worked together in a Manhattan staffing agency, and they lived in a nice apartment. Hargitay's character is a saucy one. She's trampy, she's ditzy, and her name is Dee Dee. It's just, it's painful to watch. You know, if you, if you like your Olivia Benson. McKeon, however, was basically the same character she was in Facts of Life. She was Joe, she had moved to Manhattan, she graduated from East Linden College, and, and here she is now the point guard, the setup to the ditzy Mariska Hargitay, the sensible one, the serious one. So a few, ep a few episodes of this one single season series are available on, on YouTube. It's almost like somebody queued up their VHS and videoed them into YouTube, but at least they're there. Because otherwise you would just think, I dr you know, we dreamed this whole thing. And so this Elizabeth Taylor episode, literally called the Elizabeth Taylor episode, is not available. Um, you only have to go off of what people have said on IMDb. But here's how the plot advances, according to IMDb. So Fran is in the taxi that gets into the accident. She has no memory of having possession of Taylor's package. So she walks away from it, leaving the pearls in the back seat. So in Can't Hurry Love, Annie, who is Joe or Nancy McKeon, is going on a date. She hails that cab and finds the pearls. She wears them and promptly loses them. We don't really know how. Only to later find out that they had, in fact, belonged to Elizabeth Taylor. So you're thinking, okay, I've suffered through an hour of TV, and I'm still not totally getting this whole Elizabeth Taylor thing, and she's really not on as much as I thought she was going to be. What's with all the play up? Well, here comes Murphy Brown, right? So it's going to be, oh my gosh, Elizabeth Taylor and Candace Bergen, right? Well, no, sort of. And, and, um, and I, isn't that the disappointing part of these sweeps weeks? So Murphy Brown was in its eighth of ten seasons, and this episode was called Trick or Retreat, and it was directed by Joel Regalbudo, who played Frank Fontana. Everybody loved Frank, right? Written by Diane English, who was the show's creator, and Sarah Dunn, who was also a very busy, active woman writer, writing in shows in the 90s and most recently on American Wife, if you follow that. But generations of Murphy Brown fans, all, you know, we've been living this for now the last 20 years. We are rightfully grumpy that the entire series is not available on DVD. It has never been released in its entirety. And, it, and the show itself, the series is only shown occasionally on TV. And the reason is supposedly the complex state of the music rights contract that was written when the show was launched in 1988. And that's sort of understandable, but in this day and age, really, that can't get figured out. 
So the Taylor plot is much more of a side reference in this Murphy Brown episode. Realizing that her, the famed Black Pearls were on the loose in New York, Elizabeth Taylor cancels an appearance that, was, that she was supposed to have on FYI, the fictitious show on Murphy Brown. There's a little bit of exchange about this at the beginning, but the show's main plot drifts onto a team-building retreat that Miles is taking the gang to in, the, in some sort of rural setting, and the plot unfolds there. I never saw this plot, or I don't, surely don't remember it. I, I can't see it today, and I can only believe what they say on the IMDb synopsis. If it's remotely accurate, I don't know, because, oh, honestly, isn't everything on the Internet the truth? Yeah, I would say, yeah. So at 8.30, we, find, we, we expect to find out how Taylor's pearls get recovered, right? Um, no, wrong. But at least we get to see some fabulous women actresses who, well, were just in the wrong place at the wrong time. The show that aired at 8.30, again, one you've never heard of, called High Society, it was a fall replacement for another sitcom that had barely made it past its third show, and we all remember those years, right? So on February 26th, High Society, High Society, contains some names that you'll recognize. So between these two shows, the first one, the first canceled one, was Elizabeth McGovern, yes, Cora Crawley from Downton Abbey was in this dog called If Not For You that lasted three episodes. Then it was replaced by High Society, which featured Jean Smart, who we all know as Charlene from Designing Women, and Mary McDonnell, hello, Mary McDonnell, doing comedy. And depending upon your demographic, you either know her, if I had pictures, I would show them right now, of President Laura Roslin from Battlestar Galactica, or Captain Sharon Rader from Major Crimes. Rest in, or Major... Major Crimes, rest in peace. Wow, what a decision to cancel Major Crimes. So, Jean Smart. Oh my gosh, Charlene is this big gift to comedy, right? She's got this tremendous timing. She is a gem. Mary McDonald, comedy, really? I'm not so sure about that. Um, what's worse is the fact that, well, between the casting and the writing, um, the premise of this show, this show, was not nearly as well crafted as you heard from the nanny. It just was much looser. And, and the show itself, you had Mary McDonald sort of playing a bit of a Julia Sugarbaker. She had the big hair, the big shoulder pads. Jane Meadows was in this show. And it's like, well, who was Jane Meadows again? She was famous for being famous. She was part of that generation. She was married to comedian Steve Allen, and she had some sort of light, light recurring roles on Medical Center and St. Elsewhere. And she was Mary McDonald's mother in this show. Jean Smart was Charlene, only much more vacuous. She was not really naive so much as she was just dumb. So here were these two dog shows of which really we saw women trying to do comedy and in the end they were much more talented than the bad scripts that were given them. And um, so the Mary McDonald character in High Society, the, the show setup is this. These are two grown women. They're single. They're, you know, approaching middle age. But they're really seen as... Um, as, sh as shallow, you know, Valium, martinis, cigarette jokes, easy sex. And McDonald's character has a very odd relationship with her grown son. You see some, like, eerie physical contact, which is spooky in its own right. And there was a laugh track. So what you heard from the nanny was a live audience, and you could tell they were milking as much as they could from uh, the laughter, and that live audience got to see Elizabeth Taylor in person. Um, but this last show, High Society, had a laugh track, and so they really never had any idea whether or not their jokes were going over. And I could have told them immediately, no, they weren't. Um, the plot jumps from their being robbed which is how they factor in the, the, the pearls, the black pearls. We'll just call the character Charlene. And, and so Charlene gets robbed. It's a lot easier to call her Charlene than whatever the character was. And Mary McDonald's character and her son, well, ultimately they get into some conversation and because Mary McDonald's son is there, Charlene decides she wants to, ha she too should be a mother. And that's where the rest of the plot goes. They got robbed in the beginning, they reference the black pearls, and then it falls flat. So it's just this toss-off line that you're like, that was it? All of this build-up to Taylor made Monday, and that's where it is. We, we do not know whatever happened to the Black Pearls. There was no appearance, no further integration into that flimsy s plot and that final episode of that series, which is available on YouTube if you want to spend your time, but that plot isn't, or that, that particular episode isn't. Well, it is. It is, actually. But you still can go all the way through it and not see or hear from Elizabeth Taylor. 
And it was directed by Iris Dugo, and it was written by two men. This is the interesting part. It was written by two men, Robert Horn, who had done a number of women-centric series, and Daniel Margosis, whose IMDb profile, this is fascinating, really features his work as an intern and as an executive assistant to producers of women-centric TV shows. So at some point, he was given his chance to write, and it feels to me like if they were giving away chances to write, and they had any idea that they had Gene Smart and Mary McDonnell in the room, you would have thought they either might have given it to, to a little bit more of a veteran writer, or they would have given that chance to a young woman to write more women-centric dialogue and create more credible situations. So after all that, we had no closure. We didn't really find out what happened to Elizabeth Taylor's Black Pearls. Um, Oh, Rob's following along. So Taylor undoubtedly, however, this, so that last lesson of this is that Taylor undoubtedly had negotiated this fantastic deal to get her Black Pearls line launched, this perfume. White diamonds had already been huge, right? And it was integrated into these four sitcoms, and these sitcoms were aimed squarely at women, and this was Monday nights in late winter in 1996. Life was so much simpler back then. Um, and did she, did she save these struggling s- single-season dogs, these two shows, Can't Hurry Love and High Society? No. But even being positioned between the nanny and Murphy Brown didn't help them. And in the days before DVR, think about this, and this audience probably has this memory, where what you would have had to do, what you would have had to do to step away from them is to set your, your, this was before DVR, set your VCR or watch in real time, you would just, you'd say, ah, you'd step away during these bad shows, you'd do some laundry, you'd move from washer to the dryer, dryer to the folding or whatever, or you'd like bathe your toddler or you'd pay some bills. You'd do something to get out of watching those bad shows, but sticking to your Monday night lineup. Um, And we will have no idea how many times this Black Pearls commercial, 30-second commercial, ran over the course of these two hours so that we could all just see, if nothing else, Elizabeth Taylor on TV. Um, But the the ones that did run hold this Taylor breathy voiceover and these dark images of her head only above some sort of water thing, right? So you see Elizabeth Taylor like, like skinny dipping? I'm not sure. So she's submerged in water, and then there are so- scenes of like a silhouetted body. But I will tell you this, that this would have been a silhouetted body of Taylor's body, oh, like 20 years prior to that. So... The romance of night. The ecstasy of stolen sensual moments. Black Pearls. Introducing Black Pearls, a new fragrance from Elizabeth Taylor. Doesn't that make you feel like 1996 all over again? So up until her death in 2011, Taylor was really, she singularly defined celebrity for the, for at least the United States. Maybe not for the whole world, because, you know, the, the, the whole world has a few other longer list. But in a way that today's generation might understand Beyonce to hold for us today. Um, but Beyonce didn't have two Oscars on her mantle by the time she was 35. Taylor just had something different. And so she appeared on TV frequently throughout the latter part of her life, um, which included some fun cameos from the 80s on General Hospital and All My Children. Um, But getting back to her AIDS work, it really feels as though she very much understood her power and she knew how to use it. Little exists today that helps tell the story of why on earth somebody made some decisions to allow Taylor Made Monday to happen and to happen with such moderate quality television programming. Um, You can ask yourself the question, well, did Black Pearl's perfume really reach the status that Taylor's previous product, White Diamonds, did? Well, no, because 20 years later, White Diamonds, you can still buy it. It's still marketed, and they actually still sell commercials because... Everybody likes to look at Elizabeth Taylor, even though she's been dead now for six years. But the other part that we see out of all this entire time capsule is that Fran Drescher and Candace Bergen and Mary McDonnell and Jean Smart and Mariska Hargitay were on TV on one night, and those are the blue chip actresses 
that we're going to continue seeing for years and years to come. And they have lived their lives. They've been selective in the projects that they've taken on. They have significant followings on, you know, on social media as well as just um, following of their work in, in box office sometimes when they do films. And yet their lives were not nearly as tabloid documented, filled with drama as Elizabeth Taylor came to generate in her career. Now you could say, this is just getting a little bit deeper, that Candace Bergen has kind of taken on that whole sort of stature. She is now considered this, this aspect of older Hollywood and, and having Edgar Bergen as your father doesn't hurt her um, for anybody who remembers who Edgar Bergen is. But, but the mere presence of Candace Bergen is now this attraction. But still, Candace Bergen as an attraction, I'm sorry, we would all much be happier and forever in debt to any lawyer who can figure out how to get Murphy Brown released on DVD or onto a streaming service, because that's the show that we need. So that's what we talk about here on Advanced TV History, the business and the careers and the plots, good and bad. Drop me a line with your own memories of single episodes or, the, or an entire series. Um, as I noted earlier, if podcasting intrigues you, then again, connect with me. I'm going to give you some ways to get a hold of me. The podcast is about the impact of TV on our lives, so send a note to advancedtvherstory at gmail.com or tweet me at, at tvherstory, and we'll head down this crazy rabbit hole of TV and TV history together. Um, there is so much meaning that hasn't been discussed over decades and decades of quality women's programming, quality program presented by women. Find the archives of past podcasts ready for streaming at the website tvherstory.com. Now, I want to share all with you a tip that I've been sharing with lots of people because this is the moment. This is the moment where we can focus on some of this. If you want a tip for getting through your next multi-generational family function, here it comes. You really don't want to talk about politics, right? No, nobody wants to talk about politics. You don't want to have to defend the millennial at the Thanksgiving table who's getting grief over how many tattoos he or she has. So instead, start talking about podcasts because there are some at that table who are going to be intimidated and not understand how to access a podcast. So here's your chance to grab your phone or their phone or their iPad and queue up tvherstory.com and say all you have to do is press the play button and thereby you're exposing this this person to an entire wealth of information generated by independent podcasters like, like me. And you rest assured, Advanced TV History is always rated clean, so you're also not going to get, like, you know, chewed out for exposing somebody to some F-bomb. Lastly, here we are. I am bringing you the stories of leadership and achievement and persistence by TV women. In this case, when Elizabeth Taylor probably made a lot of money for very little work, I guess that's the lesson, loyal listeners, but this is why I podcast. I'm your host, Cynthia Bemis Abrams. 